thank you for the introduction. Is that all right? The sound okay? In fish farmers in northern Thailand culture fish in earthen ponds as well as cages in rivers and in reservoirs. The two most important kinds of fish are black Nile tilapia, which you call planin here, and the red tilapia, or plataptim. Under current climate, fish farmers suffer from extremes. Sometimes too much water, sometimes too little. Since mid-2012, the Aqueduct Project has been carrying out research and assessment activities to help fish farmers. If you look at the literature globally, the current understanding of the impacts of climate change on inland aquaculture is actually quite modest. So our initial emphasis in this work has been on understanding the sensitivities and vulnerabilities to climate, as well as existing risk management practices. Insights from this are starting to get us towards thinking about how to explore adaptation strategies. Sorry. The importance of climate-related risks varies seasonally and among years. The relative importance of risks also varies geographically and among culture systems. In terms of space and things in different places, much depends on the quality of water resources and the presence and operations of water infrastructure, whether you have water gates, whether you have weirs, whether you have irrigation schemes, etc. In cage culture, extremely high and low flows have a lot of impact on production and profits. In earthen ponds, one of the surprising findings is that prolonged cloud cover, when you have very thick cloud cover, fapit, has quite a big impact on their production. Why? Prolonged cloud cover reduces the light available for photosynthesis of phytoplankton. Huh? This figure shows dissolved oxygen at different times of the day, and this is for a high input <coughs> pond. During the middle of the day, there's a lot of sunlight, and the the green stuff in the pond, the phytoplankton, is producing lots of oxygen, so oxygen goes very high. But at night time, as it gets dark, all that phytoplankton and the fish are also consuming or respiring. They're using up oxygen. So oxygen levels in pond can go very low, so low that the fish are gasping for breath and actually die. So for fish farmers, it's very important to manage DO levels in their ponds. And in particular, when you have three or four days, like when a cyclone or depression comes off the Gulf of Tonkin, you have three or four days with very high cloud cover. During the day, not much, there's not much sun, so there's not much, fight, not much oxygen produced. So when you reach the first evening, there's not much oxygen. You come to the next day, you don't gain all this oxygen, but there's a lot of fish and a lot of phytoplankton to use up the oxygen at night, and so you get mass mortality events. One way to, for fish farmers to do it, of course, is to put aerators in or try to mix the water, try to get some more oxygen in. But it costs money, so they can't do it all the time. Other ways to reduce risks, of course, is not to make your water too green. I mean, when, it, when it's very, very green, a lot of phytoplankton, too much nutrients, your risks are really high. But if you put just a few fish and not too much inputs, your risks are a bit lower. This next graph shows the average level of concern against a whole set of risks to profits. And in this, as I said in the earlier slide, you know, the risks from climate-related things, of course, they are important, but they're not the only risks a fish cage farmer faces. There are also significant risks related to markets and diseases, etc. For example, and not surprising, the biggest financial concern for, for fish farmers is how cost the feed inputs are and what the sale price of fish is. If the sale price is five months later when they start fishing, if the sale price is low, they're going to lose profits. No? So climate and non-climate things are both important. This next graph shows the importance whoops, sorry. This next graph shows the importance of several risk practices at the farm level. You'll see from here that there's technical things, economic things, as well as social things that are all important. For example, selecting good little fish, fish stock, and feed is really an important technical thing that fish farmers need to do. But it's also important to maintain financial reserves. And maintaining, quite a few of these things are about social things, and about maintaining good relationships with the Department of Fisheries, maintaining good relationships with other f fish farmers, maintaining good relationships with the Obata, with the local government agency. Other studies in the project, this Aquadap project, have shown that the social networks of farmers are actually very important for managing risks and for dealing with uh, bad events. There is also 
at the river basin level, not just at the farmer, at the river basin level, when you have to have collective action, you have to do things together with other fish farmers, there's another set of management practices that can reduce or increase your risks to climate. Important ones including the influencing the operations of water infrastructure, when they open and close gates, dam releases, etc. And the management of water, watershed pollution sources, which is of course quite hard to influence, but they try. And now if you put together things that they do at the farm level, things that they do at the river level, things related to climate and not, claim, not, not related to climate, there's really two important things you find. First of all, that several practices may help manage one risk. So you do several different things just to manage one risk. But also, a specific practice, reducing stocking density, etc., may actually influence the management of four or five other risks. Risks are not managed by themselves one at a time, one off in the real world. It's not only about the fish farm. Fish farms take place within a household portfolio of activities. Fish farming households vary in their vulnerabilities and strategies. Households with many, many fish ponds, they have more money, they have more assets, they have land, they have cars, and they have external sources more than small fish farms. As a consequence, they're better at preventing losses and recover faster, more quickly than small farms. Social relations like those in fish farmer growing associations and local, through water, local water management institutions can, be, can help reduce the gap between small farmers and big farmers, but they don't always do so. There's all kinds of power relations at the local level. Another way household varies in capacities to be mobile. Mobility in a household that farm fish is important to build resilience two ways. Firstly, a history of mobility and remittances means that that household has opportunities to get other knowledge and also more money to invest in the fish farm in the first place. And also, mobility after extreme events is important as a way to recover from losses or to re-establish the livelihood, uh, the, fish, the fish farming livelihood. Understanding perceptions and attitudes towards risk, whether people are scared of risks or they're willing to gamble, um, is very important to understanding the decisions farmers make. And to do this end, we've developed a role-playing simulation game that you sort of play on your little iPhone or your little Samsung tablet, etc. In the game, fish farmers had to choose to invest at a low, medium, or high amount, or a lot of, a lot of some, and, or many fish. And the, the game is this property. If you stock at a high level and it doesn't flood, you make lots of money, you're rich. But if you stock at a high level and it floods, you lose a lot of money as well. So it captures one of the key tensions of the decision-making of farmers. One of the intriguing findings is that farmers found it really hard to learn or choose an optimal stocking density or get a high score in the game when floods were common or had large impacts. This is disturbing because that might be what's going to happen under future climate. This images here of the Chaprai River Basin show changes in rainfall um, compared to a baseline where red means stays more or less the same and blue means wetter than historical past. These figures come from the analysis of downscale projections from nine DCMs under the resource concentration pathway 8.5, so a high emissions scenario. If you take a, a medium one like 4.5, the pattern is similar but not quite so extreme. Of course, there's substantial uncertainties with respect to future rainfall, but this analysis, which is the averages of the, the nine models, it sort of gives you the middle tendency, suggests that there'd be quite a lot more wetter in, Jul in July, August, September. If that was the case, that means significantly higher flood risks. Fortunately, fish farmers are used to dealing with uncertainty and variability in climate. They know how risks vary seasonally, that some decades are wetter than dry or drier than others, and that there's a lot of year-to-year -year variation in the variables that are important to their farming. These two graphs on the right show the number of days with high flows and low flows beyond a certain threshold at Nawarat Bridge in the middle of Chiang Mai that we know is important for fish farmers who grow with cages further downstream. So when you have a lot of wet days, like 2005 and 2011 were major floods in Chiang Mai as well. Cages got destroyed, fish escape, etc. So we know something about the thresholds. Farmers also know in different places, this picture is Upper Nan, Upper Ping on the left, and this is Upper, upper Nan, different rivers. The, 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 the seasonal pattern in different rivers depends on the regula regulatory effects of dams. Sir, the, in the Upper Nan has big Syracuse dam just upstream for it. So the seasonal pattern of when it's risky to grow fish is different from what you expect from rainfall, etc. 
in, we've been working with farmers in lots of little meetings and discussions and sort of participatory approaches to try to think how do you deal with current climate risks and what would you do if the next 10 years was different from the last 10 years. And we're finding out, we're learning a lot from fish farmers about existing technical options, their costs and their limitations. We're also studying the commodity chain, a little bit studying the markets, the middlemen. The only example I'll talk about briefly is hatcheries. Production of fish fry hat in hatcheries very seasonally, reflecting both temperature and available of water. So in the north here, most of the fish, little fish are grown when it's warm and wet. And when it's cold and dry, it's actually quite hard to grow tilapia. It's, it's, it's outside its temperature range. So in this, warming might be actually helpful for the hatcheries. Key adaptation strategies identified by hatchery um, operators include getting better at managing risks of high and low flows today, strengthening multi-year monitoring systems every three to five years, seeing how you're going, checking your production figures, investing in genetics and breeding programs, of course, and establishing better information systems. So in summary, this table gives some examples of existing climate risk management practices and proposed adaptation actions. For example, a common short-term thing is to share warning information or to move cages toward the banks. At intermediate levels, if you want to influence infrastructure operations and allocation of water, you're going to have to collectively lobby. And that obviously takes time to build the relationships, etc. There's a lot of detail in here. It's not important. But the important thing is that adaptation is going to involve things at different time and space scales. So in conclusion, I have three points. The Aquadapt studies have significantly expanded understanding of climate sensitivities and vulnerabilities in inland aquaculture. So far, the findings of our study really support the approach to adaptation that includes building on existing risk management practices, institutions, and policies. That doesn't mean the only thing you need to do, but it's a good place to start. And overall, this sector, we're quite impressed by some things. Oh, and this is maybe a personal view, but adaptation over the next few decades seems quite plausible given the sector's capacity for innovation, but will not be without some technical, institutional, and behavioral challenges, and particularly related to water resources. So my last slide is to thank the Aquadapt team. This work is done by quite a large group of students and, 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 and professors at Shanghai University and Meijou University and was funded by IDRC. So thank you very much.